there's nothing that they can do. They are helpless. It's the people versus the scientific world. And it has surfaced, and the people are now speaking out. I am convinced that when the people of the community understand the unbelievably unknown nature of the dangers, tampering with millions of years of evolution, they'll say no. The city council should not play with it. You should not ban it completely forever. That would be a very, very stupid thing to do. Cambridge, Massachusetts, June 1976. A busy, crowded city and home of Harvard University. The city council is about to take action that will stun the world of science. It asks Harvard not to begin a new type of research until the council has decided whether or not to ban it completely. The research planned for this laboratory involves the engineering of genes. In Cambridge, the debate over the new experiments has spilled into the streets. We Science for the People are here to try to bring the issues of this controversy to the public, to the people, because the people are at risk and are at benefit from the experiments that are being done with recombinant DNA. The idea of genetic engineering going on in his city horrifies Cambridge Mayor Alfred Vellucci. I'm worried about all the uh, presentations that were made by uh, scientists be at the city council meeting. It was stated in the city council that anything could come out. In fact, they don't even know what, what's going to eventually come out of this experimentation. It could be anything. It could be um, uh, contamination, infections, something that could crawl out of the laboratory, such as a Frankenstein. The feeling has been generated that we want to work in a laboratory with things known to be dangerous. That's not at all the case. Nothing we plan to work with is known to be dangerous. Now, as to the unknown, one can do one's best about trying to figure out what might lie ahead, but research deals with the unknown. This film will show how scientists and the public are trying to come to terms with a dramatic new technique, a technique that gives scientists unprecedented power to manipulate nature. But it was devised to help understand nature to unlock a secret that has remained inviolate since life began. How a simple acorn becomes a mighty oak. A community of specialized cells, trunk cells, bark cells, cells forming branches, twigs, stems, leaves. How a human being inheriting a set of genetic instructions from its father and mother can develop from a single egg cell into a baby. Every cell of the billions that make up this six-week-old girl contains the same set of genes. Yet in the process of development before birth, her cells went their separate ways. Somehow different genes were switched on in the different cells, making them skin cells, nail cells, cells of eyes, mouth, and hair. How these genetic switches work in a creature as complex as a human being is a total mystery. Perhaps the most intriguing mystery facing scientists today. The genes of this creature are better understood. A bacterium that lives in the human gut. It's called Escherichia coli, E. coli for short. It's the most studied organism on Earth in part because it's so cooperative. A single E. coli in a drop of water will multiply itself enormously if given a few simple chemicals to eat and if it's kept warm and gently shaken. In a day, the original bacterium can become 100 billion. E. coli also gives up its genes very easily. Detergent bursts open the microbes, spilling out their genetic material. A little alcohol allows the genes to be spun onto a glass rod. This is deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA. It's the material not only of E. coli's genes, 
but the genes of all living creatures, including, of course, the genes of man. An E. coli bacterium ruptured with detergent lies with its DNA strewn around it. But also in the photograph, magnified a hundred thousand times, is a tiny loop of extra DNA, called a plasmid. This plasmid is the key to the new technology of gene transplantation. A centrifuge begins the process of harvesting plasmids. Its rotor has been spun at high speed for 24 hours. In it are tubes containing the DNA from ruptured E. coli. The huge forces generated by the centrifuge have separated the plasmid DNA from the rest of the DNA in the bacteria. Under ultraviolet light, a dye makes the two separated bands of DNA glow visibly. A hypodermic needle pushed through the wall of the plastic tube, then draws off the plasmid band. What comes next electrified the world of biology when it was first done in 1972. To the E. coli plasmids are added plasmids from a different species of bacterium. Both plasmids are snipped open with a special enzyme. The E. coli plasmid is cut only once. The other plasmids are chopped into pieces. E. coli plasmids reform with fragments from the second plasmid tucked within them. The result is a few hybrid plasmids made of the recombined DNA of two different species of bacteria. But separated plasmids are not alive. To grow, they must be put back into E. coli. First, the plasmids are added to a broth of E. coli that has been dosed with salt. These key steps in the experiment were devised by Annie Chang and Stanley Cohen in their laboratory at Stanford University. The mixture of salty bacteria and plasmids is then taken from ice and put into warm water. The salt and the sudden rise in temperature make the bacteria porous, allowing the plasmids to slip inside. The few bacteria that have swallowed recombinant plasmids now contain the transplanted genes of a different species of microbe. They can be picked out and allowed to multiply. With this experiment, man had broken nature's barrier that prevents different species from exchanging genes. Stanley Cohen. It was a very exciting time in the lab because before we did these experiments, we had no assurance that we would be able to take genes from a totally unrelated organism and be able to transplant them into E. coli. And when we found that we could and that they would survive and grow there, we thought that maybe we could even transplant genes from a even more distantly related organism, namely an animal cell, uh, into E. coli, and perhaps they would also survive and grow. A South African frog provided a suitable gene for transplantation. What should one expect of an E. coli with a frog gene transplant? Collaborating in the experiment, John Morrow. Well, we did not expect the bacteria to hop around the lab or turn green uh, like frogs. But we did hope that we would be able to transfer DNA across a very large species barrier. In fact, from one kingdom to another, from an animal to a bacterium. And we hoped that after we transferred the DNA that it would multiply in the bacteria and the bacteria would be uh, like little factories for us producing a large amount of this desired gene. The frog gene transplant worked. These are E. coli dividing and multiplying, speeded up about a thousand times. With every division, they copy their own DNA and also the frog gene carried by the recombinant plasmid. In a day or so, they make large quantities of the frog gene. The experiment opened the way to manufacturing the purified genes of any animal, an essential first step in finding out how they work. These silkworms provide one example of how the new technology allows John Morrow to study a specific gene. Silkworms spend six weeks munching mulberry leaves and doing little else. 
one day there's a change. They stop eating and start spinning. Their silk gene has been switched on. The silk gene remains active for a few days, producing almost a mile of thread for the silkworm to make its cocoon. Suddenly, as it was switched on, the silk gene shuts off. The silkworm, as it becomes a moth, has no more need of it. By putting the silk gene into this plasmid, then growing it in E. coli, John Morrow hopes to produce enough copies of the gene to study its on-off switch. Other biologists had the same idea of using the plasmid to produce large amounts of genes they were interested in. Stanley Cohen started to hear from them and began to get a little worried. Even before the first experiments were published, word of the ability to transplant genes into E. coli began to get around among the scientific community. And at that time, the plasmid we used was the only one known to be usable for these kinds of experiments. And we began to get letters from our scientific colleagues who wanted to use the plasmid in their own experiments. We were concerned that some of the uses that they might make might be potentially hazardous. So before agreeing to send out his plasmid, Cohen asked that its use be limited. He felt uncomfortable in this role as a self-appointed policeman. But his discomfort was minor compared to the experience that was about to befall another Stanford researcher. Well, that's an interesting one. Paul Berg studies viruses that cause cancer in animals. In 1973, he planned to transplant the genes of an animal cancer virus into E. coli to help find out how the genes work. Word of his intentions spread. The first news that I ever received of anybody being uh, upset about the experiments we had in progress was a telephone call from one of my students who was attending a conference at Cold Spring Harbor. And she told me that in the course of the discussions there, she had mentioned the experiment that we intended to do and received uh, rather severe criticism from a number of people. And she called me to relay this criticism and asked me what I thought about it. My initial reaction was, first of all, surprise. And then as I thought about it a bit, I thought it was even more outrageous than my initial reaction. But Berg's sense of outrage that anyone should consider his experiment hazardous diminished as he spoke to colleagues at Stanford and elsewhere. His own doubts began to increase. And although it was clear there was no hard data which could establish that it would be risky, nevertheless, I couldn't convince myself that it was totally without any risk. And since I felt that while I would be willing to take the risk of doing such an experiment if I was the only one to be exposed, I began to think in terms of whether it was my prerogative to in fact make that decision for other people who worked with me and around me. And in fact, I finally decided that even if the probability was very low, it was still indeterminate, and we decided not to carry on this experiment any further. Berg's decision fueled the growing concern that giving E. coli foreign genes might turn it from a harmless to a dangerous microbe. Adding to this concern was E. coli's ability to pass on some of its plasmids via a long extension tube to other bacteria. Specifically, the fears were these. First, that a gene for a toxin like botulent would be put into E. coli, causing someone who swallowed it to become sick. This gene might also be passed on to other microbes and make them deadly too. There was also concern over experiments in which an animal's entire set of genes would be chopped up at random and the pieces put into plasmids. 
The aim of so-called shotgun experiments like these is to pick out and study a particular animal gene. But some scientists worry that animals might possess genes that could be harmful if put into a bacterium. The most alarming possibility was that a cancer gene might get picked up by chance in a shotgun experiment or be put there deliberately in the sort of experiment Berg was planning and that this gene might then somehow be passed into the cells of someone who swallowed it, sowing the seeds of cancer. As these concerns grew, Paul Berg met at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology with others planning experiments. They decided to call for an international meeting to evaluate the risks. But international meetings take months to plan. At the pace at which various laboratories were undertaking experiments, we realized that many of the experiments we were most concerned about would probably be done by the time the meeting was convened. It was an attempt to head off these experiments that convinced us that we had to be in touch with the scientific uh, colleagues to tell them of our concerns and to request that they not carry out such experiments until they could be examined at this meeting. The group published an open letter calling for a voluntary deferral on many recombinant experiments and a go slow on others. Their action was unprecedented. Never before had scientists called a halt on their research. It was eight months later at Asilomar on the California coast that the international meeting was finally convened. During those months, the moratorium held. Even though many scientists, especially those outside the United States, considered the idea ridiculous. 130 scientists, a few lawyers, and a small contingent from the press met together at Asilomar for three days. This chapel housed the main sessions, a location several participants found appropriate for exploring their new power over nature. Paul Berg on the organizing committee had high hopes that all would go smoothly. When I came to the Asilomar conference, I was pretty confident about the outcome. We'd worked very hard to prepare the format for the meeting, and I had a reasonable expectation of what the meeting would decide upon. My view was that we would recognize the importance of the research and that we would recommend that the work should go ahead, but we would try to devise means to do the work safely. When I arrived, however, I found that there were very widely divergent views. There were those who felt that the research was much too dangerous to proceed and that we should not carry out such experiments in the laboratories of universities and institutes. But there was also a very large segment of the population here who felt that the research should proceed and there was little or no risk and that the imposition of any guidelines would be a disastrous step. I thought that we would be able to resolve those opposing views during the course of the meeting, but as it proceeded, it became clear that they almost seemed irreconcilable. And about halfway through the meeting, I had this sudden fear that we would break up at the time that we had designated without having arrived at any consensus and leave ourselves open to the possibility of having regulations imposed on us for the conduct of such research. In the breaks between sessions, the arguments went on. The whole idea of regulating research disturbed many people concerned about the scientific tradition of free inquiry. Others were worried that the Asilomar meeting itself would alarm the public and lead to demands that the research be stopped or put under government controls. But most debate was about the degree of risk posed by the research. No one was prepared to assert it was entirely risk-free. So talk turned to containment how to prevent escape of any hazardous organisms that might be made. Memories went back to Fort Detrick, Maryland, the U.S. Army's germ warfare research establishment. This film, made in the early 1950s, shows Fort Detrick in its heyday, working with some of the most dangerous organisms known to man. Anthrax, smallpox, Q fever, plague. Volunteers were routinely exposed to aerosols of less dangerous organisms generated inside a huge sphere. Today, the sphere is a victim of a recent fire. All germ warfare work at Fort Detrick was abandoned in 1969 with the signing of an international treaty outlawing biological weapons.
But Fort Detrick left behind a legacy of experience in containing hazardous microbes. In its early years, there were a large number of infections. But during its last decade of operation, when microbes were handled inside airtight cabinets, there was only a single infection, when one of the rubber gloves that allow workers to put their hands in the cabinets was accidentally ruptured. Fort Detrick has other barriers against the escape of microorganisms. A special sewage plant that heats all liquids to 300 degrees. A huge incinerator for burning all solid wastes. So microbes can be contained, but the effort makes research cumbersome and very expensive. There are alternative and simpler ways of containing microbes. One already in widespread use is a special hood that maintains a continuous downdraft of filtered air. And when it is switched on, creates a curtain of air across its mouth, preventing microbes from escaping. But to use it, the operator has to put his hands inside. And if something goes wrong with the airflow, as in this demonstration, then the draft caused by someone walking by can allow microbes to leak out. So hoods like this are not infallible. And there was something else on the minds of the scientists at Asilomar. The people who work in a normal biology laboratory treat E. coli as the harmless microbe they know it to be, creating endless opportunities for its escape. This more than usually clumsy experimenter is a member of the Nova film crew, but the mistakes he is making are typical. Careless mouth pipetting. Sloppy use of a mixing machine. Pouring billions of microbes down the drains. People are the weak link in any containment system. And what if the microbe they work with isn't as harmless as they think? In August 1976, a mystery disease struck the American Legion Convention in Philadelphia, meeting in the now closed Bellevue Stratford Hotel. 180 Legionnaires became sick and 29 died. Early in the investigation, experts feared the disease might remain a mystery. There's an outside chance that we may never find out what has been the cause of this. I think we will, but uh, there are times uh, when uh, uh, diseases baffle uh, all of us. No one ever suggested that Legionnaire's disease was caused by recombinant DNA research, but some have used it as an example of what could happen. You made 40 degrees of all who believe in you. And even though their bodies lie in the earth, they trust... The specter of a mystery disease being blamed, rightly or wrongly, on their research is a sobering one for scientists. Long before Philadelphia, this fear was raised at Asilomar by a man who has since become the most prominent critic of the research. At the California Institute of Technology, Robert Sinsheimer. I don't think that one can just exclude the possibility of the outbreak of disease from recombinant DNA research. Most people that I know would agree that it's certainly possible in principle to construct some quite dangerous organisms by means of recombinant DNA research. And I don't see any way to rigorously exclude the possibility that such might arise inadvertently. Mysterious outbreaks of disease are not all that infrequent. And if one of these could logically or even plausibly be attributed to recombinant DNA, I think that would result in uh, requirements for very rest real restrictions, very severe restrictions on research of this kind, possibly even to its uh, abandonment. At Asilomar, Sinsheimer's argument weighed heavily. So the problem remained. Paul Berg and others concerned about the possible risks of the research agreed that conventional ways to prevent E. coli from escaping were inadequate. But on the other hand, the risks were so hypothetical that banning the research or doing it all under Fort Detrick-like conditions seemed absurd. The conference was deadlocked. But then came a turning point. One of the things that had a very dramatic effect on the whole mood of the conference was the emergence of the idea that we could genetically modify the microorganisms we were using so that they could not grow outside of the laboratory. 
One of the benefits of this is, of course, if any organism escaped from the laboratory where an investigator was doing an experiment, it would die and would not be able to propagate outside in the environment. Groups of scientists met to talk about ways of crippling E. coli so that it couldn't survive if it escaped. It seemed simple. Most people thought it could be done in weeks. And so a Silomar ended in agreement. The voluntary moratorium would last another month or two until the crippled E. coli became available. Then most experiments could go ahead using a combination of physical containment and the weakened micro. The most dangerous experiments would remain banned. The Asilomar Agreement was unique in science. But it was by no means the end of the story. These tubes contain E. coli. They're the starting point of the search that began at Asilomar for a crippled microbe. At the University of Alabama Medical School, Roy Curtis has devised hundreds of different strains of E. coli with particular properties that make them useful for research. Here, he is transferring some E. coli taken from the freezer into a liquid where they can grow. Isolated 50 years ago from a hospital patient, the laboratory strains of E. coli have now almost lost the ability to live in the human intestine. But they can survive there briefly and could get passed into the sewers. Using chemicals that cause mutations, Curtis set out to create a strain that couldn't survive in the outside world because it needs a special diet found only in the laboratory. Unfortunately for people waiting to begin recombinant DNA experiments, E. coli was uncooperative. When spread on nutrient plates and kept warm overnight, normal E. coli will grow into small colonies that appear like spots on the plate. Fed its special diet, the crippled E. coli grew as expected. The unpleasant surprise was that somehow it still formed colonies, although rather abnormal ones, when it wasn't fed its special diet. Suddenly, making a crippled E. coli didn't seem as easy as it had at Asilomar. Several months after Asilomar, our telephone began to ring. People wanted to know, how are you coming, Roy? How's the safe strain? That was a little bit embarrassing because at that time, E. coli was still doing a good job outsmarting us. And we learned that uh, we were the only lab anywhere in the world that was trying to do this. That really began to put the pressure on because we knew that there were lots and lots of people out there waiting to do experiments that needed our strain. It took Curtis almost a year to beat E. coli. These are the chemicals needed by an ordinary laboratory E. coli to grow. Curtis' safe strain needs five additional chemicals, several of them found nowhere but in the laboratory. The crippled strain is also super sensitive to detergent. It's killed too by the bile found in the human gut. And it has one last problem should it ever find itself in the outside world. Sunlight. This plate left out in the sun has grown colonies only on the shaded side. Sunlight kills the crippled strain. Curtis named his strain Chi 1776 to celebrate the bicentennial. Then came the task of distributing it. The scientists who at Asilomar had agreed to put off experiments until a safe strain was available had never dreamed it would take so long. All over the world, they were anxious to begin experiments. But it wasn't only the safe strain of E. coli that delayed them. In Washington, the National Institutes of Health had the task of turning the Asilomar recommendations into binding guidelines. First, there was a question never asked at Asilomar. Why not simply ban the research outright? NIH Director Donald Fredrickson. Well, I thought perhaps that the problem might be most easily solved by banning this kind of research. And yet that thought didn't linger in my mind very long. First of all, there's no way it could be prescribed throughout the whole world community of science. And secondly, it would be wrong not to take advantage of the enormous potential of these techniques.
surely there had to be a way to, that we could find to use this technique in a prudent way that would permit it to continue without creating a disaster for the world. But to draw up these guidelines took a committee of scientists a year filled with bitter debate. Based on the Asilomar principles, the NIH guidelines do totally ban experiments thought to pose an obvious hazard, like those involving the genes of disease-causing organisms or toxins. All other experiments are classified according to their potential risk. This laboratory at Fort Dietrich is an example of the conditions required for work of the highest potential risk allowed by the guidelines. Physical containment of this level is called P4. Because it is so difficult to assess unknown dangers, the guidelines committee had to make some assumptions. They decided that the potential risk of an experiment depends on the source of the gene being transplanted. If it comes from a creature close to man on the evolutionary scale, the gene was judged more likely to make E. coli into something dangerous to man. So scientists studying higher animal or human genes have to work in glove boxes like these that totally isolate man from microbe. And they must also use the crippled strain of E. coli. This laboratory is a maze of barriers designed to make it next to impossible for a microbe to escape. Air, water, waste materials, equipment, all must be decontaminated before being allowed outside. Anything the experimenter wants to remove from the glove box is heated to 250 degrees in this double door autoclave. Then it's sterilized again before being taken out of the building. As for the scientist himself, a shower prevents experimental microbes from leaving with him. P4 is so expensive that Fort Dietrich may reopen for recombinant experiments. But many universities will have their own P3 laboratories, the next lower level of containment. Paul Berg's is in a busy science complex at Stanford, but it's isolated by a special ventilation system. All work must be done in a laminar flow hood, with traps to keep liquids from escaping. The guidelines require P3 plus the crippled E. coli for experiments involving the genes of any warm-blooded animal. P3 work also means careful attention to hygiene, protective clothing for experimenters, and provision within the laboratory for sterilizing all equipment and waste. The next lower level of containment is P2. As with P3 and P4, NOVA could not have filmed this P2 laboratory at Harvard Medical School if an actual recombination experiment were taking place. P2 is required for John Morrow's silk gene studies, as for all experiments using plant or insect DNA. The rules here are basically common sense, mechanical instead of mouth pipetting, daily decontamination of work areas and equipment, no eating, drinking, or smoking allowed. No one doubts that the guidelines will slow down recombinant DNA experiments, especially those requiring P3 or P4. But will they make them safe? Paul Berg. I believe the guidelines establish requirements that are far in excess of any risk that could be justified on the basis of any scientific evidence that exists today. Many of us have agreed that this would be necessary to begin
because of political considerations and in fact to assuage the fears of the public. But on purely scientific grounds, I believe most scientists believe that the guidelines are excessive. Most, but not all. One who disagrees is Harvard biologist Ruth Hubbard. The guidelines are trying to uh, deal with, trying to counteract hazards that they themselves say are unknown and until much more work is done, unknowable. And I don't know how one can counteract hazards that one doesn't know and doesn't understand. So I think the very notion of formulating guidelines by way of reassurance, I think they may reassure the public. I think they may even reassure the investigators that they are doing the right thing. But what that right thing is and why they think it's the right thing uh, is uh, not at all clear to me. Whatever one's opinion of the guidelines, the chance of an E. coli with foreign genes escaping cannot be totally ruled out. No one claims the guidelines are infallible. So could an escaping recombinant microbe sweep through the population? NOVA could find no expert in infectious diseases who considered this a realistic possibility. And even the minority of scientists who oppose the research do not predict raging epidemics. But some foresee other sinister consequences. What we're going to get, or what we might well get, is just a lot of mystery diseases cropping up in a lot of different places, uh, conceivably or quite possibly cancers and things like that cropping up that have an enormous lead time, 15, 20 years, so that it'd be essentially impossible to ever track them back. And maybe looking back over this period, 30, 40 years hence, one will be able to say, oh yeah, something strange and different seems to have happened in the year 1975 or 1976. Because from then on, things look uh, different in the pattern of, of disease incidents and so on. And that's what worries me more than that we're going to produce one huge pandemic that's going to wipe us all out overnight. Cancer is the most ugly scenario. And to test it, this mobile P4 laboratory, built originally to study deadly infectious diseases, is being refitted and installed at the National Institutes of Health. In this high containment trailer, scientists will dose rats with E. coli containing cancer genes. If the rats develop tumors, it will mean that the genes carried by E. coli can find their way into the cells of animals and so, perhaps, of people. If the rats don't develop tumors, fears like Ruth Hubbard's would be reduced. Unfortunately, this single experiment isn't likely to give us a clear-cut answer, and other experiments are now being planned. Meanwhile, recombinant DNA research is getting underway. E. coli carrying foreign genes could, by accident, be reaching the sewers and from there leaking into the environment. The NIH guidelines may ensure that nothing harmful to man will escape. But what about the rest of nature? Robert Sinsheimer. There's a rather novel aspect to the hazard here that we're dealing with living organisms. And so that what we do may well be irreversible. As when such organisms are released into the environment, there's no simple way to just recall them or cease their manufacture. Some might inadvertently be harmful. Not necessarily directly to man, but to other organisms on whose function we rely directly or indirectly. I think it's very, very difficult for us to predict that possibility. In effect, we are introducing organisms developed by a whole new mechanism, sort of like introducing a quantum step into evolution. And I don't believe we have the knowledge to predict the outcome. Sinzheimer believes that the very act of mixing the genes of animals and bacteria breaches some forbidden barrier in nature, an idea that receives little support from other biologists. Sinzheimer has a very personal view of the nature of the risks involved in recombinant DNA research. He imagines that there's a barrier that prevents the interchange of genetic material between simple forms of life and higher organisms. If you accept his view,
that that barrier dare not be breached without causing very extreme consequences in evolution, then the guidelines would be senseless. That is, it doesn't make any sense to rank experiments in terms of their potential risk if you assume that any of these experiments are risky. But as far as I know, most experiments, most scientists do not acknowledge the existence of such a barrier, and there is no evidence to support such a barrier. With scientists clashing like this, how does the man in the street know what to believe? How does a community like Cambridge, faced with expert opinion on each side, cope with the issues raised by recombinant DNA research? It wasn't hard for Mayor Alfred Vellucci to make up his mind. Scientists are disagreeing with one another. Nobel Prize winners are disagreeing with Nobel Prize winners. And since they can't uh, agree, uh, that leaves it up to me as a layman to decide. And since I'm going to have to decide, then I'm going to have to take the side of those that disagree. They uh, maintain that it is not a 100% guarantee. Um, and uh, since they take the stand that it's not 100% guarantee, and since the scientists who are favoring this agree that it's not 100%, that it is impossible to guarantee 100%, then I have to be the common man who has to say that uh, if it is not 100%, then I will have to take the stand to, be oppo to oppose any of this kind of dangerous experimentation in the city of Cambridge. Recombinant DNA research became a public issue in Cambridge because of plans to construct a P3 facility in this building, the biological laboratories of Harvard University. An old teaching laboratory was to be converted to P3 standards. An article about the plan caught Mayor Vellucci's eye and the debate went public. When the city council held hearings to examine the plan, not Harvard capacity. scientists found themselves put on the spot. Now you made the statement there's no known dangerous organism has ever been produced by a recombinant DNA experiment. Yes. Now just what the hell do you think you're going to do if you do produce one? Asking the embarrassing question was David Clem, a young city councilor who spent weeks going back over the hearing to find some way to cope with the issue. Well I tried to break down the issue into two facets. One is the scientific element which is the potential of risk, how you define that risk, what the dangers could be. I discovered very early on that I am not technically capable uh, or able to evaluate the element of scientific risk. So I looked at the other facet, which is the process that was used in establishing guidelines to control uh, for danger. And I think, as a layperson, that I am able to come to grips with that process. Clem's view that a choice can be made on non-technical grounds was shared by a group of radical scientists. It's not so much the technical issue of whether things are dangerous or not as a, as a fairly more obvious political issue that looking at how decisions have been made and who's been making them and who's decided what's safe and what isn't, if you look at that closely, you really wonder what's going on. Donald Fredrickson of the National Institutes of Health did try to involve the public in his decision by holding a hearing before issuing the guidelines. But the fact remains that the guidelines were written by scientists themselves. The concept of scientists developing their own guidelines to do their own work under bothers me. I raised the issue with the representative from NIH whether or not she believed in civilian control of the military. And to me, that's the point. We don't want generals running the military any more than we want the automobile industry establishing pollution control standards or safety standards. And I don't think we want the scientists designing their own rules of the game. Is there any choice when dealing with complex scientific issues? At Cambridge City Hospital, a committee of lay people met weekly for four months, appointed by the city council to recommend whether or not P3 research should be allowed. Meanwhile, Cambridge scientists agreed to a moratorium. I cannot. Today the group is hearing from Harvard's Matt Meselson. Disprove it, but everything I know about microbiology, evolution, infectious disease makes me confident that there is no hazard. <laughs>
This group of eight lay people focused on the risks of the research as they might affect the citizens of Cambridge. But in the national debate, there are also potential benefits to be considered. Washington attorney Peter Hutt. The real issue here, from a public policy standpoint, is to balance, on the one hand, the benefit that can be obtained from recombinant DNA research against the risk that is inherent in any research or indeed in any human endeavor. Now, I am not a scientist, I'm not a physician, but I see no one who has argued with the basic proposition that the potential benefit to mankind is enormous. Many of these potential benefits are medical. These are cancer cells growing uncontrollably. Probably something has gone wrong with their gene switches, and recombinant DNA technology offers one of the best routes to finding out where the error might be. Other potential benefits are in the drug industry. Pharmaceutical manufacturers have long used microbes to produce drugs like antibiotics. From large vats of microorganisms, a few pounds of product are harvested. But microbes can make only what their natural genes specify. If other genes could be transplanted into them, their range of products might be greatly extended. Insulin, for example, today comes from pigs and is growing scarce. If the gene for human insulin could be transferred to E. coli, then the microbes would provide diabetics with a new source of insulin for their daily injections. Other life-giving molecules are in even shorter supply. One is needed by patients with hemophilia, whose blood lacks a factor that allows it to clot properly. Children with hemophilia must guard against cuts and bruises, and even then often suffer internal bleeding in their joints. The missing clotting factor can be supplied, but it is scarce and very expensive. E. coli that could make human clotting factor would provide enough for many more patients that are now able to receive it. Another chemical that's growing expensive on a very different scale is ammonia. Ammonia is the main source of the nitrogen needed by most staple crops. Over 40 million tons of nitrogen fertilizer are spread on the world's fields each year. Manufacturing fertilizer is an expensive business. The nitrogen comes from the air, but fixing it into a usable form takes high temperatures and pressures and an increasingly scarce resource, natural gas. Beans, like the soybean, can fix nitrogen for nothing. Their secret is in the nodules that cluster on their roots. Inside the nodules are bacteria that can take nitrogen from the air and supply it to the bean. Staple crops like wheat don't harbor those helpful nitrogen-fixing microbes. So scientists hope to use recombinant DNA technology to tailor-make nitrogen-fixing bacteria that can live in the roots of crops. Another idea is to transplant genes from nitrogen-fixing bacteria directly into a crop plant like corn so that the plants themselves can pull all the nitrogen they need from the air around them. The benefits of genetic engineering lie in the future, but their appeal for industry creates an immediate problem of control. The NIH guidelines apply only to researchers receiving NIH grants. Senator Edward Kennedy is among those concerned that industrial research isn't covered by the guidelines. If uh, this, this research is being done now in, in industry, uh, in, in various parts of this country that are not complying with the NIH guidelines, I mean, could that not be an, an ominous situation? Well, it's very probable, Mr. Chairman, although I cannot tell you from certain knowledge, it's very probable that the precautions being taken by industry where it may be engaged in this may be every bit as stringent as the, as the NIH. But you don't government. know that, though. I don't know that. Despite assurances from industry that it will comply, pressure is growing to turn the NIH guidelines into binding legislation. But over all the debate about the safety and control of recombinant DNA research has hung another very different concern. <laughs>
that one day it will lead to the genetic engineering of humans. I think people are worried about more than the danger to the public health and environment. They're worried about the question of genetic engineering. There's a feeling that this type of research is a giant step in the direction of being forced to deal with questions that we just don't have answers for. The future of the species, the type of children we will have, the type of children we won't have. The people feel that this type of research has really taken us down that road very quickly. And although that issue hasn't been stated, I think it's very much in the public's mind. I think that the public sphere of genetic engineering, in the sense that they understand it as a power or some dreadful capacity to change the nature of man, has entered unfortunately into this controversy and in an unreasonable way. For surely these techniques are not at the present time designed to change human genetic material at all. Perhaps they might be used for that purpose in the future. But that's a long way off as I see it, and a matter which the public will have ample opportunity to control when the time comes. We don't know whether recombinant DNA technology will lead to the ability to change human genes. It very well might. One thing we can be confident of, I think, is that ability will come. I don't think it's uh, just uh, near, nearby. It won't be next week. It won't be for many years, so far as I can see. But I think we can be pretty confident that as, as science moves ahead, that we will come to understand so much about fundamental biology that we will, yes, be able to change uh, human genes, change what people are. The question is, how will it be used to change what people are? Seven children in a hundred are born with a genetic disease. Human genetic engineering might allow many to lead lives as normal and happy as these children. But will society be tempted to use it for less benign motives? If it's an open, humane society, uh, the technology will be used to prevent the suffering which now takes place when children are born with pathetic genetic defects. If it's some kind of monster society, uh, some uh, an imaginably horrible Hitlerian type society, then who knows to what use it would be put. The important point here is not the nature of the technology, but the nature of society. Because without any technology at all, a, a monster society can do the most monstrous things. Society has come to realize that there's a, a progression. Science, technology, social effects of that technology, which impact on everybody. And I think that we're kind of groping, rather the public is groping in a, in a rather determined way for means to intervene in that progression so that it isn't just an inevitable sequence in which everybody is sort of a helpless pawn. The Cambridge City Council's attempt to avoid that fate led to its calling a six-month halt on P3 research while its specially appointed panel of lay people assessed the risks. In January 1977, the panel submitted its report. The public was at last to have its say. But it rejected Mayor Volucci's demand for a 100% guarantee, settling instead for a reasonable likelihood that the research is safe. It is the unanimous judgment of the Cambridge Experimentation Review Board that recombinant DNA research can be permitted in Cambridge, provided that the research is undertaken with strict adherence to the NIH guidelines, and in addition to those guidelines, the following conditions are met. These conditions included monitoring the health of laboratory workers and giving the community a role in enforcing the guidelines. The thoughtfulness of the report proved that lay people can participate in decisions usually left to the scientists. Relative to the conduct of said but the man who forced the issue before the public found himself rejecting its advice. No person shall conduct genetic experiments involving recombinant DNA molecules at the P3 and P4 containment levels in any laboratory, building, or other structure within the city of Cambridge. Any person who violates this provision of this section shall be liable for a fine of $1,000 per day for every day that the violation continues.
I intend to, to uh, introduce this into the city council. Mayor Volucci's we'll proposed ordinance was narrowly rejected by the council. And this will but simply banning the research may still seem an attractive solution to many, frustrated by the sense that science is getting out of control. I think that the possibility of banning further research on recombinant DNA or suppressing the acquisition of further knowledge about it would be the worst possible step that we could take as a nation or indeed as a world or as a community such as the community of Cambridge. I've never seen any problem solved in this country or anywhere in all civilization by suppressing inquiry, intellectual and academic inquiry. I really have a great fear that turning off a line of research particularly because we don't like the kind of information it might uncover or we're fearful of the consequences of the information it might uncover would set a very dangerous precedent because if it succeeds here I can't see any reason why we would not begin to look at all forms of inquiry and ask do we or do we not want to have the answers that these inquiries might turn up. I think we have to be more realistic and understand that we have no assurance that science will not make the world a more dangerous place rather than a less dangerous place. That is, knowledge can bring us into a more hazardous situation. That still doesn't mean, to my mind, that we shouldn't acquire knowledge. But I think we have to be more careful both how we acquire it and how we use it. Thank you.